New York, the city of dreams, where fortunes are made, and where, sometimes, trust is broken irreparably. Bernard Lawrence Madoff, the bright-eyed son of New York, stepped into Wall Street in 1960. His firm, Bernard L. Madoff Investment Securities LLC, would soon become a beacon of success, handling approximately $300 billion in orders a year by the 2000s. Madoff promised what every investor dreamt of, consistency. With claims of steady annual returns of 10% to 15%, his strategy was hailed as genius. And for decades, it seemed like Madoff had the Midas touch. The Bernie Madoff Ponzi scheme, one of the most infamous financial frauds in history, operated under a classic Ponzi structure, albeit on an unprecedented scale. Here's an outline of how it worked, 1. Promising high returns, Bernie Madoff promised consistent and unusually high returns to his investors. He often reported steady annual gains of around 10% to 15%, even when the market was down. 2. Initial payouts using new capital, initially. Madoff paid returns to earlier investors using the principal amounts that newer investors brought into the scheme, rather than legitimate profits. This is the foundational element of any Ponzi scheme. 3. Reputation and exclusivity, Madoff had built a strong reputation over decades. He was a former chairman of Nasdaq and was well respected in the financial community. He used this reputation to attract more investors. Additionally, by making his fund appear exclusive and selective about its investors, he created a sense of urgency and privilege about investing with him, enticing more people to invest. 4. Faking trade reports, to assure his clients, Madoff produced fake trade reports. These reports showed securities purchases and sales that had never occurred. The detailed and consistent reporting gave a facade of legitimacy and transparency. 5. No real investments, in reality, Madoff made very few, if any, actual stock or securities trades for his clients. Instead, the money was simply deposited in a Chase bank account, from which redemptions were paid out. 6. Feeder funds, Madoff didn't only take investments from individual investors. He had feeder funds, which are investment funds that funneled their clients' money into Madoff's operation, believing they were investing in legitimate opportunities. This expanded the reach of his scheme, attracting capital from other funds and institutional investors. 7. Lack of skepticism. Many investors and some regulators failed to be adequately skeptical of Madoff's reported returns. Those who did raise concerns or found inconsistencies in Madoff's reports were often placated or ignored. 8. Increasing difficulty. As with all Ponzi schemes, the structure becomes increasingly unsustainable over time. To keep the illusion going, Madoff needed to continually attract more funds to pay out promised returns to earlier investors. 9. Collapse, the scheme began to unravel during the 2008 financial crisis. As market conditions worsened, more investors sought to withdraw their funds. Facing requests for returns amounting to billions, Madoff couldn't keep up. 10. Confession and arrest, in December 2008, Madoff confessed to his sons who then reported him to the federal authorities. He was arrested the next day. Later investigations revealed the extent of the fraud, with the total fabricated gains amounting to approximately $65 billion. But in 2008, amidst the world's financial tremors, Madoff's empire began to show cracks. As clients requested a total of $7 billion in returns, the truth unfurled. There wasn't enough. Madoff's consistent returns were but a mirage. The reality? A $65 billion Ponzi scheme. The number is staggering. The real loss to investors was $20 billion, a sum composed of countless life savings, dreams, and futures. But beyond the numbers lay the heartbreak. I lost everything. Over $2 million money I'd saved for 40 years. We were going to buy a house, start a family. It's all gone now. From Hollywood celebrities to local school teachers, from pension funds in Europe to banks in Asia, the deceit had snaked its way into the lives and institutions of countless individuals. The scandal saw victims in 136 countries. Charities felt a profound impact. The Elie Wiesel Foundation for Humanity lost $15.2 million, 
almost its entire endowment. The JHT Foundation was forced to close its doors. Hundreds of charities faced severe setbacks, their beneficiaries left in the cold embrace of abandonment. For many, the pain was personal. But for the Madoffs, it was familial. The once celebrated family name became a heavy cross to bear. Mark Madoff, Bernie's eldest son, unable to cope with the ignominy, took his own life two years after the scandal broke. Worldwide, institutions trembled. Spain's Banco Bilbao Vizcaya Argentaria had exposure of up to $400 million. HSBC estimated its exposure to be around $1 billion. The aftershocks of Madoff's deceit were felt from the boulevards of Paris to the shores of Tokyo. Every corner of society bore the scars. Investors, already grappling with the 2008 crisis, were further disillusioned. Trust in financial institutions waned, and the societal fabric, once tightly knit by trust, seemed to unravel. In the aftermath, Madoff was convicted and sentenced to 150 years in prison for operating the largest Ponzi scheme in history. But no sentence could recapture the lost trust or fill the void left in countless lives. The repercussions of his deceit affected thousands of investors and had a profound impact on the financial industry's regulations, and the general trust in the investment community. The Madoff scandal is not just a tale of financial treachery. It's a poignant reminder of the frailty of trust, the fragility of dreams, and the deep wounds that betrayal can inflict. In its aftermath, the world looks forward, with hope, resilience, and a prayer that such a heartbreak is never relived.